Welcome back everyone. Now that we have seen powerful programming tools, we can return to modeling. So we have seen data wrangling and programming and let's see how modeling works and how we use it. The goal of a model is to provide a simple low dimensional summary of a data set. That means we want to capture the true signals which are patterns generated by the phenomenon of interest and we want to ignore the noise. So the keywords here are, we want to create a low dimensional summary. We want to capture the true signals which are patterns generated by the phenomenon of interest and we want to ignore the noise which is random variation. So this is random variation and this is phenomenon of interest. All right. So we will look at predictive models, which as the name suggests, generates predictions. There is also something called data discovery models, but we're not going to focus on that right now. Something else that you can all read about is hypothesis generation versus hypothesis confirmation. And we will also look at EDA, which is exploratory data analysis, something we have mentioned earlier as well. So if you want to do confirmatory analysis, one idea is to do 60% training, 20% query and 20% test, right? So an example would be do 60% Training. You can do 20% query and then another 20% of test. This partitioning allows you to explore the training data, which will generate the candidate hypothesis and you can check it with the query set. And when you're confident that you have the right model, you can check it only one time with the test data. So remember, even when you do confirmatory modeling, you still have to do EDA. And if you don't do any EDA, you will be blind to the problems of quality in your data set. So you have to do it in any case. All right, let's, uh, let's you know what, let's jump straight into it. I think we've done a lot of theory. Let's do some examples. So I'm taking model R and let's look at a simple model to begin with. I think we've already done earlier. Now we can see a strong pattern in the data and let us use a model to capture that pattern and make it explicit. It is our job to supply the basic form of the model. Like in this case, the relationship looks linear. So we start by getting a feel for what the model would look like. So let's do this. And we will also do a ggplot like this. Okay, it says the model is not found. One second. Right. Now, there are 250 models on this plot and a lot of them are really bad. So, we need to find the good models by making our intuition more precise, which is that a good model is close to the data. And we need to find a way to quantify the distance between the data and the model. And once we have done that, we can then fit the model by finding the value of the independent variables, which will allow us to generate the model with the smallest distance from the data. Now, one way of doing this is to, coming back to the PowerPoint, which is here, one way of doing that is to do this. 
which is to create a vertical distance between each point and the model. So this distance is just the difference between the y value given by the model, which is the prediction, and the actual y value in the data, which is the response. So to compute this distance, we first turn our model family into an R function. So this will take the model parameters and the data as inputs and give values predicted by the model as output. Let's see this like this. Next, we need a way to compute an overall distance between the predicted and the actual values. In other words, the plot above shows 30 distances. So how do we collapse that into a single number? For this in statistics, we use something called root mean squared deviation. You can do a Google search. So broadly, we compute the difference between the actual and the predicted. We square them, we average them, and then we take the square root. And this has a lot of appealing mathematical properties, but I'm not going to talk about all that right now. Let's see. Once we have done this, we will have to use a helper function. All right, as you can see, we have 250 rows and we want to overlay the 10 best models to the data. So we have colored it like this. One second. Let me just make sure that everything is coming properly. So I think my model R has to be run once again. Yeah, so it's working. And what do we have here? We have the overlay of the 10 best models on the data. We can also think about these models as observations and visualizing with the scatter plot of A1 versus A2, again coloring it in the same way. Let's see. Now, here we can no longer directly see how the model compares to the data, but we can see many models at once. Again, we have highlighted the 10 best models and we have drawn red circles underneath them here. So remember, instead of trying lots of random models, we can also be more systematic and generate an evenly spaced grid of points. This is called a grid search. Like this. And when we overlay the 10 best models back to the original data, they all look pretty good, like this. So we can imagine iteratively making the grid finer and finer and finer until we have narrowed in on the best model. But there is a better way to tackle that problem, which is a numerical minimization tool called the Newton Raphson search. Let me just Mention it here so you can Google this. It's the numerical minimization tool called the Newton Raphson search. Again, I'm not getting into details here. You can uh, read about this if you want to. Right. There is obviously a lot more in modeling than I have spoken about, but this at least gives you a little bit of sense of how we go about the models in terms of the modeling basics and modeling building. Obviously, this can be quite detailed and uh, there is a lot that you can do with it. I just want to take one more example with you. Now, in the, in the previous example, we saw how linear models work, right? So, I want to add some real data sets. Let's take our NYC flights, right? And 
you know in the previous lectures we had seen very surprising relationship between the quality of diamonds and the price so low quality diamonds which are poor cuts bad colors and inferior clarity have higher prices so i'm just showing them to you one by one if you notice the worst diamond color is j which is uh, slightly yellow and the worst clarity is l1 where inclusions are visible to the naked eye so it looks like lower quality diamonds have higher prices because there is an important confounding variable which is the weight of the diamond and the weight of the diamond is the single most important factor for determining the price of the diamond and you know lower quality diamonds tend to be larger so here this is a hexbin plot and we can make it easier to see how other attributes of a diamond are affecting the relative price by fitting a model to separate out the effect of carat so we can make a few tweaks here like we can focus on diamonds smaller than 2.5 carats which is 99.7% of the data and we can also do a log transformation like this and this will essentially make it easier to see the relationship between the carat and the price so the log transformation is useful because it makes the pattern linear and linear patterns are easier in fact they are the easiest to work with again i'm not getting into too much in detail here just a little bit that i wanted to show you uh, as to how we go around building a model the last thing that i want to talk about is something called r markdown so i'll not really be covering this but i would strongly urge you to do a google search and read about this so r markdown essentially is a tool for integrating the code and the results and it is very important because we can use it in notebook mode and you know when as an analyst you want to communicate with other analysts and you want to um present a report and show it to the decision makers this can create a documentation that can help you again there is a lot of excellent content available on the internet so you just have to do a google search and read about this the topic is called r markdown wonderful so that completes our course everyone i hope all of you learned a lot remember this is a journey not a destination we have just scratched the surface people have spent many many years working on r and you know like to say the more you learn the humble or the humbler you become and you realize there is yet so much more to learn but i hope this was a good start for all of you who are beginning your programming journey especially on r and if you haven't really understood each one of the topics that i have covered remember that's completely okay one you can't learn everything in one sitting you have to practice a lot and you know you learn things after having done the same thing over and over again and also you have to keep in mind that you don't really need to memorize everything and probably all the topics are not equally relevant for you so while i have introduced many many different things which i feel are important your use cases might be very different so please feel free to skip or maybe prioritize less of the topics that you feel are not important to you and focus more on the topics that are more important to you all the very best everyone and i hope you get the chance to see my other courses as well on python for beginners on excel on power bi tableau and powerpoint Bye bye